The New Testament text, the uh, Galatians passage, reminds us about the need to love your neighbor. And as you recall, Jesus even ratchets it up a little bit or a lot by telling us, love your enemy. Do we love our enemies? Um, who, who's your enemy? We talked about the last couple of Sundays about the fact that um, we like to argue. We, we like to prove ourselves to be right. We like to point out the wrongs in the other person. We like to control the situation or maybe control the other person as well. And so we like to argue about all kinds of things, even about God. We like to argue with God even sometimes, but certainly we like to assert that we're right. And then we also talked about the fact that um, we get offended. Maybe because we like to argue, it's kind of everything is interconnected, but we get offended. There's all kinds of things that offend us. Sometimes it's something that's personal. Somebody's criticizing fairly or maybe unfairly saying something about us that we don't like. We get offended. Sometimes we get offended if um, somebody is, is critical or saying something negative about a group that we belong to. Um, and we, we, we kind of take it at, uh, as a personal offense as well. Sometimes we get offended on behalf of somebody else. Sometimes we get offended on behalf of God. And, and you can see that we are easily offended. Now, what happens to, um, to you and to the people around you with whom you argue all the time or who offend you? Well, they become your enemy. Maybe they're not like arch enemy, and, uh, but they are your opponents, somebody who you do not along, get along with. And so it doesn't take too much, and it doesn't take too long for you to start thinking about those whom, with whom you disagree, with whom you argue, as your enemy. And we like to argue, it doesn't take too much to offend us, and I think we love our enemy. But not in the sense that Jesus has when he tells us to love your enemy. And because enemies comes with, having enemies comes with benefits. And once again, benefits, quotation mark, because they're not really good for us. But we think they are. So what are some of the benefits of having an enemy? Well, one of the benefits is that, uh, let's say you have a common enemy. It unites us. Think about after 9-11. That's probably in your lifetime, if you're older a little bit, probably that was the time when we felt united because with this, we had this big, huge common enemy and so Americans came together in the face of this threat. Now, those, thankfully, those types of events do not happen too often. Um, but it just serves us uh, as an example of what it means to be united in the face of one common enemy. But sometimes this type of being united against a common enemy takes on this sinister turn, and we become united against somebody we all dislike or disagree with. And so in schools, you have children uniting and singling out somebody they don't like and uh, because of his or her appearance, um, employees, they find this common enemy in their boss or their supervisor. So it's very common for employees have this bond because, well, they have the same grievances and complaints about somebody they don't like, their boss mainly. Now, this is used by politicians all day long. This is how they work. Usually, lately, you've noticed that, is that they, uh, they, 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 they paint the picture and say, I'm the good guy, and my ideas are like your ideas. I'm for everything that you 
agree with, and I'm against everything that you disagree with. But look at that guy or that woman. He is or she is the enemy. And so you see this card played all day long. And, um, and then it, so it's a benefit, and people get behind and like, yeah, let's go get her or him. And then and another benefit of having an enemy is that you can always blame the enemy, whether it's uh, uh, your opponent or uh, even, you know, on a global scale, you can blame the foreign power and say, well, that's the reason. It's the enemy that caused it. So all kinds of benefits of having an enemy. We live in a society, we call it divided society, but what does it mean to have a divided society? It means that we have those lines drawn, and, and we, it's us and versus them, and them is not our friends. And what's the opposite of having a friend? It's an, having an enemy. And so we, we're divided, conservative, liberal, uh, Republican, uh, Democrat, uh, pro-life, pro-choice. Uh, Second Amendment, anti-gun. And, and we go down the line, and, and, and our rhetoric very often is that of facing face, the face-off, kind of like you on both sides, on the different sides of the line, and you're just facing each other, and you're ready to fight. And we fight verbally, and we fight with our ideas, and we lob those verbal grenades at each other. But sometimes those antagonist, antagonistic and hostile rhetoric, it, it, uh, it turns from just being words into actions. Um, and we want our enemies to lose. We want our enemies to be gone. And um, the extreme case, uh, of course, is um, you want to get rid of your enemy um, and, and, and to kill the enemy, you know. But most of the time... Uh, maybe in your head you wish for that, but most of the time we, we, we don't really articulate that or don't even believe that. But we kind of want our enemies to be gone. We want them to be silenced. We want them to be locked up. They want, we want them to be behind the wall. We want them to be um, uh, off our TV screen from our schools. We want them to be gone. Uh, we want them to disappear. We want them to leave uh, if it's an antagonist in the congregation, we want them to leave the congregation. If a pastor that we don't like, we want him to leave. We want people with whom we disagree, our enemy is gone. That's the sinful nature's response to having an enemy. We want that enemy to be just wiped out, one way or another. Maybe not physically, but we don't want to see him or hear him or her. Such is the case in our gospel text. We have um, Jews, first century Jews and Samaritans, and uh, they still were in kind of a civil uh, relationship. They coexisted, kind of like we coexist with all those people with whom we disagree, right? Uh, but the lines are divided. Uh, the lines are drawn and they're divided. So it's Jews versus the Samaritans. There's a religious aspect to it, ethnical, cultural aspect, all those things. So they still live in the same proximity. Jesus is traveling. This is a very logistical problem. He is traveling to Jerusalem. He has to pass through a Samaritan village. And, um, and when you think about Jesus, he is traveling with his disciples. And, and you know by now that the disciples of Jesus, the followers of Jesus, not just the 12 men, there's other men and women as well. And so you have this big group of people that's moving through uh, and uh, basically, they need some place to stay, and they need a place where they can eat. And so what they do, they send somebody ahead and say, can you host us? Do you have enough places where we can find room and board? So that's the case in our text. They're traveling through a Samaritan village, and they send the messengers ahead into the village, and the village says no. Now, when the Samaritan villagers say no to Jesus, not directly, but through the people whom he sent, those people are taking that offense personally. You know, we talked about it last week, about the fact that sometimes we take offenses personally, even though they're not directed at us, especially 
when it concerns God. And sometimes we feel like, well, God is being wronged, but I'm going to do something about it. And our text specifically names James and John. And, and we talked about it before, is that sometimes we want, if it's something that we think is offending God, we want God to do something. Because we say, God, you're getting offended. You need to step in and do something. But if he's not doing something, we say, well, he needs to send somebody else to do it for him. And so we're looking for kind of a powerful uh, a man or a woman who will speak up against the enemies of God. But if that doesn't happen, we say, well, I'll do it. I'll take matters in my hand, and I'll do it. And so this is what the disciples say. So James and John say, Lord, do you want us? We can do it. You want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them. Clearly, they're very offended. And, and the way that the text reads and the, the commentaries that I've read, the consensus is that James and John were the ones who were sent to the village, and they were the ones who were told no. And so they're the ones who taken it personally because it was said to them personally, no, you're not welcome. So they get offended on their own behalf and then on the behalf of God. So they have all this time as they go back from the Samaritan village back to Jesus, they have all this time to reflect, but probably more like get angry. They were really angry at this time. So they come back to Jesus, and they suggest, we're going to do it ourselves. Just give us the uh, license to do it. We're gonna, and, and we're not going to just punish them in the kind of subtle way, you know. We're going to make it this real awesome, because then nobody will make a mistake. Nobody will mess with us then, because we're going uh, gonna to strike them with a the fire from heaven. Now, think about for a moment, out of all the arsenal that God has to punish his people, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about some, something you know, uh, more complex, like, well, I'm going to send them uh, childish leaders. And so, okay, yeah, yeah they're going to fail in a generation or two. But that doesn't really publicly display the might and power of God. And that's what James and John want. They want the public to see how God is so awesome in his destruction. So let's send fire from, from, from heaven. And um, lightning and, uh, and, and thunder and uh, tornadoes and winds and all those things that come from the outside, from, 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 from the sky, have been around for, uh, from the beginning of times. But we live in a century that uh, for us, we can really appreciate what they're asking for. They want the fire to rain down on their enemies. Um, it, it was about 100 years ago when we have this introduction into the uh, modern warfare of artillery and then aircraft and then missiles and bombs being dropped from the sky. And, and those of you who have studied history uh, and have seen the, the horror and, uh, uh, and the devastation caused by, by airstrikes in, uh, remember the pictures of Dresden or uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the atomic bomb. And uh, that's the kind of death that they had in mind, something that's very terrifying. Um, those of you who are old enough, again, like me, growing up, growing up in the Cold War, this is what I knew, that the death would be coming from the sky. Very, very, very terrifying. That's what they want their enemies to experience. What's Jesus' response? He rebukes them. Now, you know that the Bible doesn't come, was not handed down to us in a, like a, 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 on a tablet, uh, not on the modern tablet, you know, the old-fashioned tablets, whatever they were, uh, it was not handed down to us as a book. It's comprised of uh, different sources uh, and manuscripts. And so some manuscripts include this rebuke that's inserted there after it says Jesus rebuked them. It actually tells us what he said. You do not know what sort of spirit you are, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy man's souls, but to save. You see... Jesus did not come to 
destroy, but to save. And you can ask this question, have um, the uh, villagers of Samaria uh, been proclaimed the gospel? No. Have they hardened their hearts? Have they outright rejected Jesus? No. And in fact, very soon, the same Luke will record these words when Jesus speaks to his disciples. Uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And down the road in Luke chapter, I mean in Acts chapter 9, Luke will say these words. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So it's not going to be very long that the people of Samaria, of this Samaritan village and the rest of Samaritans will become a part of the church. What's the teaching? Well, as long as the world stands, there exists a call and opportunity not to rain fire on your enemies, but to preach the gospel in the hope that they will receive it and repent it of their sin and be saved. And those who wish for their enemies to be wiped out, to be destroyed, to be gone, they're not of the Holy Spirit. But you and I have the Holy Spirit. And in Him we can have the true benefits of having enemies. It is actually good to have enemies because they provide for you and me a perfect opportunity to be imitators of God as his beloved children, to love your enemy, to pray for those who persecute you, to never take revenge, to overcome evil with good, to feed them when they're hungry, to give water to the thirsty and clothes to the naked. And I can go on with that list. Because as Jesus says, it's one thing that you love people that love you back. Don't even tax collectors do that, he says. But if you love those who hate you, with whom you disagree, who oppose you, who mock you, if you love those who hate you and do good to those who wish you evil and sue you, then you are doing what your father wants you to do. But here's another example or another benefit in having enemies because it really exposes to you just how much you love yourself. And that brings you to repentance. Because if you ever start thinking to yourself, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good, righteous, you know, uh, good citizen. I'm not maybe completely perfect, but I'm certainly better than a lot of people. And then pretty soon it's like most people. You think you're better than most people. Then take a note of the way that you think about your enemies. We talked about us versus them. So... Think about them, and think about the reaction that you get when you hear them, when you talk to them, when you see their faces on TV, when you listen to their agenda. Take a note of how you feel and how you respond to the people who wrong you, curse you, or treat you like crap. Now, those thoughts and feelings are going to be a true indicator of how righteous you are. But don't be afraid. Because even though you and I were at enmity, we were enemies with God. 
He did not come to this earth to destroy us, to rain fire upon us. Yes, sin is what separates us from God. And in fact, we are by nature enemies of God. But God shows us that he loves us, his enemies. His is the kind of love that feeds you when you're hungry, gives you a drink when you're thirsty, closes you when you're naked, gives you a shirt when you're walks with you multiple miles when you just need a few steps and so on and so forth. When Jesus came, instead of calling down fire on his enemies, he did something else. Even at the end, when he had that chance, and I think when people want him to do that, instead of calling on the legions of angels, he surrenders himself to the hand of angry, hateful sinners who nail him to the cross. He who would overcome evil with good is overcome by evil man. And now he feeds you when you are hungry. He feeds you with his body. You who are thirsty, he pours his blood into you. You who are naked because of your sin and exposed because of your shame, he closes you with the robe of his righteousness. His righteousness covers you up. He does it all to overcome the evil that is within you with the good that he is, that he gives, that is all for you because he loves you. And he loves all, even his enemies, whose sins are forgiven, just like yours, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.